All right, guys, I uh, hope you are staying safe. Welcome back to another episode of the Viral Quick Dive. We're going to go right into it. Basically, we're going to talk about, number one, you know, there's been news about Malaysia being a failed state. So we're getting a lot of texts and messages on Facebook, Instagram, email as to, you know, is this time to sell your stocks, right? Uh, things doesn't look so positive in terms of Malaysia's handling of COVID. We're going to give you our thoughts on it. That's number one. Then we're going to talk about Genting. Uh, a lot of people have been asking us about this question, this talk, and we're going to share some of our thoughts. And then lastly, we'll talk about SCIB, which is uh, the third of the infamous trio of Suba Dynamic, K-Power, uh, and then of course, SCIB. So you want to get started on building your six to seven figure stock portfolio? We have a free training lineup and you can find that training in the comment section below. All right, John. So let's start with uh, SCIB, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and for those of you who don't know, right, the full name is called uh, Sarawak Consolidated Industries Berhad. And it's a company that's linked, uh, it's talked a lot about because it's linked to Karib, right? Yeah. Sabah Dynamic main man. So, uh, John, as the resident Sarawakian, how would you describe <laughs> this company? And when you were in, when you're still staying in Sarawak, you know, is that, uh, is this a name you hear a lot? Yeah, it was uh, quite famous even back in the day when I was still growing up in Kuching. Um, very construction-based company. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, they cut their teeth into uh, a lot of cement work. I think right. their biggest chunk of revenue today comes from this uh, manufacturing division where they manufacture this thing called precast concrete. So maybe some context, if you are into the construction line, um, you usually perform this thing called form work first. That means you build the frame of a building and then you pour cement in, in situ. The struggle with that kind of process is that the quality of the cement is very difficult to control because you have trucks that actually shuttle between where the cement is actually mixed and then to the construction site. So if you the truck waits too long, the cement hardens, you know. So the new trend in construction is actually they have what we call like Lego blocks, uh, precast concrete. And that actually contributes about 52% of their um, revenues. Right. And they are trying to pick up uh, construction and EPCC, uh, as you know, Karim is very famous yeah. for coming in and go. then getting contracts in the Middle East, you know. <laughs> yeah. Same old, same old. So my, 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 my question is, you know, uh, relating to the fact that it's EPCC, I think, you know, cement is interesting because, uh, you know, in, in Sarawak, obviously it's not as developed as uh, yeah. West Malaysia. So a lot of infrastructure is yet to be built. Correct. But of course, since there are so few people, you know, companies will wonder, do they really need to build or not, right? So that's a separate discussion. But I'm looking at the, uh, you know, at my, my screen here, right? And that yeah. the... Stock price is down like since the high of 27 January all the way mm -hmm. down to today. Okay. It's like 76% down. So yeah. uh it's it's the Serba treatment, right? It's uh it, it happened with K Power, it's happening with uh Serba Dynamic. The share price is uh, going down because of whatever happening to Karim. Yeah. And so right. my question to you is like, is it justified like it seems to me that it's being priced to failure very similar to k power right now uh yeah i think uh the power of association uh, i would say power yeah <laughs> guilt by association guilt right? by association uh. the, the the struggle that i face as well is is the same struggle uh when i looked at serba which they had this substantial growth in revenue but it was actually not backed up by cash flow again so if, if you, if, I plot it out on a graph and as you can see, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, right? Revenue was okay. You're talking about probably high single digit or a low double digit kind of growth. But the year 2020, you saw their revenue actually fivefold. Yeah. But then profit, profit only went up like, uh, I would say twofold, threefolds but operating cash flow was still negative. So you see that 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 still is a grave concern to me. Uh, I may be wrong. I may be looking at the numbers uh, 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 not deep enough, but the, the crux of a company, a good company has always been that 
you grow revenue sustainably, you grow net profit sustainably, and you grow operating cash flow sustainably. And it all smells almost the same from, from my opinion. Uh, I could be wrong. But um, yeah, if, regardless of valuations, I think a good business always has the numbers to back it up. Uh, but I don't see it uh, from my opinion. So I think uh, there's one big difference is that the construction of EPCC, um, you can say, uh, projects is a lot less, um, to use a Malay word, a lot less jungle, a lot less, uh, you know, modern than the ones in K-Power. Am I right to say that? Yeah, uh, actually a lot of their work is related to ordinary buildings, normal buildings. Right. Um, they have a lot of infra work for their precast. So when I say infra work, so you look at things like, what is often forgotten are things like drains, culverts, you know, yep. and yep. all that. And I think their uh, manufacturing division is uh, it's quite heavily involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have much color on their EPCC works in Middle East because it's not very uh, clearly defined. But you're right, it's less chunge uh, compared to the hydropower yeah. plants kind of construction. Uh. Yeah. And so I, I think, yeah, you're, you're right. So I think the numbers in terms of, you know, the cash flow, it's not that great. But then also the, the kind of the projects that they, they're working on uh, not as exciting as K Power. Would yeah. you agree? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually, as investors, we don't really need. I, I guess you align with me. We don't really need to worry whether they're exciting or not. But is is if they're boring, but they bring in the numbers, I yeah, get yeah. excited. <laughs> but it's like they are boring, but they still don't bring in the numbers. That doesn't really get me excited, I Yeah, that, and that's also how I put it. like okay. it's. Yeah, it's just basic infrastructure. Uh, like really, Correct. there's no differentiation. There is nothing, you know, about the... Uh, I, I mean, one angle I would go at is the fact that I think why, why SEIB was so interested by many parties uh, in the market was because of how it, it went up so fast. Correct. So as important as it is to ask why the share price went down a lot, equally important is to ask uh, why did the share price go up so much uh, in the first place? Yes. And, because and from I think 20, like just in 20 July last year, all the way until January this year, it was up four folds. I don't know if you know yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, the current effect, lah, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have any final thoughts on, uh, you know, your your hometown uh, champion, you know? Uh, in a way, they are quite monopolistic because, ah. uh, yeah, it, it's it, in Sarawak especially, it's, uh, they I would say they corner a big chunk of the market. And um, I think cement, especially cement, is quite controlled in Sarawak. So I, I, where they stand from, uh, you're right that it's not a very uh, technically uh, advanced mode that other competitors may come in. But I think they hold somewhat of a monopoly and that's where I think uh, they have this advantage. But then again, saying that, Look at the time of Sarawak. Uh, I think the biggest thing going uh, for Sarawak right now is the Trans Borneo Highway. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, um, there's little infrastructure spending that will get you excited. That's why I think they had to venture to the Middle East. Uh. So, time, time again, uh, total addressable market. Uh. How, you're talking about the size of a population of uh, <laughs> half a million? Ha ha yeah, no, 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 no. More about, uh, yeah, but, uh, half a million for Kuching alone, yes, yes. But how much can you? built in terms of infrastructure as compared to, let's say, Greater KL, which has a population of close to 10 million, you see. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's how I sum it up. All right, moving on. All right, so uh, before I move on, right, uh, I just share with you guys something. If you have a stock idea, an investment idea in whether it's the Malaysian market, the US market or any market, and you need someone to really check whether or not your thesis, right, whether or not your reasons for buying or selling the stock is good, uh, we are actually accepting you to send us emails uh, with a Google Doc or a Google Sheet or both. Uh, send it to the email here. We'll put it on the screen and we'll give you a free review, right? We'll just tell you and just email you our thoughts uh, as to whether or not the investment is good. Okay, uh, so the next talk that we're going to talk about is uh, Genting or Genting as some Singaporeans call it. Uh, a lot of you Malaysians may not know this, but some Singaporeans actually call it Genting. Yes, you heard that right. Uh, 
Yen Ting Ma. <laughs> yeah, but even then it's uh, it's Y, right? So I don't know yeah. how the J decide to pop in. Uh. But anyway, so uh this is something that a lot of people ask us a lot uh, as well. Uh what do we think of Gun Ting, right? Um if you look on my screen here, the 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 share price is basically battered uh, since COVID, right? It's down like uh a lot basically. There is a bounce back, to be fair. Uh so it's that's why it's only down about twenty one percent. But when you look as a whole, if you look at a whole, right, from to a peak in 2017, it's actually down 50%. So mm. problems for Genting actually already started before COVID. Yeah. Right? So if you are only interested in what's happening to Genting because of COVID, I think you'll need to, you know, read a little bit deeper. deeper. Yeah. All right. So... You know, just look at look at the numbers. What's interesting is that they're actually not like they're not stagnant. They're actually growing. Uh, if you look at uh, my screen, right on Chat Investor, they went from seventeen million to twenty one million uh, in twenty nineteen. Not a massive amount to shout about, uh, but of course, here's where it gets interesting, right? Although the revenue grew by about let's call it. 20%, profits actually never grow, right? Profits mm. were like... Stagnant. 2019 was 3.6 uh, billion, 3.7 billion in 2012. So, John, if you had to guess, right, like why do you think, uh, you know, Genting is really, is is struggling basically? Or, I wouldn't say struggling, like, just not doing as well as Stagnating, such a dominant think, player would, would, yeah. would be expected to do. Yeah. I think... If you talk about the saturation of the, especially the gaming market, right? They actually rely very heavily on foreign tourists. Yeah. And with the sprouting of yeah, Singapore Sands and then Macau, um, I think even Tan Sri Lim Kote, which is the executive, is he the executive chairman or CEO? I can't remember uh, mm -hmm. whether he holds both posts. But he, he himself uh, knew uh, that even uh, going outside was the the growth answer for Genting. Because Malaysia yeah. itself, I think, even uh, with the monopoly license, right, they rely heavily on foreign tourists coming in. Uh. So actually COVID just put the dampener on Genting even more on steroids. Uh. Uh, yeah. The the funny thing about Genting is that it's not just, while they derive a majority of the revenue from, from gaming, right, it's, I, I would look at it more of a conglomerate. Would you agree, MJ? Yeah, because they have implantation, they have property, yeah. they're even in oil and gas, you know, they buy and sell oil and gas, things like that. Yeah, yeah. So I think, as you rightly pointed out, uh, it was stagnating uh, a lot of factors that were, in a way, beyond their control, foreign foreign, yeah. foreign uh, tourists coming in and all that. I, and they got into a bit of a blooper with uh, the licensing. I don't know if you remember that, uh, MJ, the licensing yeah, of their right, yeah. theme, theme park. Mm -hmm. Uh <laughs> There's a lot of stories, delayed, delayed uh, project launches and all that. And I think that also put on a dampener. Uh, because if you were a family traveling to Genting, um, I, 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 don't, I don't gamble or I don't gamble much. Actually, I only probably gamble once in, in like hey, five years. You invest years. in the stock market, what, John? <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, jokes aside, but, yeah, yeah, sorry, carry on. Yeah, but going going to the casino, every time I go Genting, I've, I've, uh, for the last three or four visits I've been there, I've never gone into the casino once. You know, it's really just to bring my children for, for a holiday to the theme park and all that. You yeah. get the cooling effect. But I would say that if that doesn't materialize fast enough, uh, revenue for them will even stagnate even more, la, I, I feel. Yeah. Like. You know, you know what? I, I think when I compare it to, let's say, uh, okay, so theme parks, right? Let's say. Um, mm, mm, mm. I think you need like really good branding. Yeah. So if you look at like Disney or you look at like Universal Studios, whatever you want to call it, uh, people go there for the theme parks and there's this certain magic about it. Yes. Right? There's some branding, some, you can't really quantify it, but it's there. Yeah. But the way it works in Genting is, it, it, it doesn't get that branding. When you think Genting, it's not, the first thing is not really the uh, theme parks, right? It's, it's the gambling. Yeah, it's and yeah. it's also the convenience because I think for for a lot of locals who go there, 
they're going there for the in a way the temperature <laughs> or the environment yeah but you yeah. see that's only local to Malaysia so when they expand the question is how do they create that branding right yeah precisely and precisely. if you think about how let's say a competitor like Disney right kids want to keep going back right yeah. how much did it cost again when you went to Disneyland uh I think and on average probably about 150 to 200 ringgit per ticket right so yeah let's say for every entry for let's say two kids right standard so it's yeah. let's say 400 ringgit yeah um they go in they the kids enjoy themselves then they buy merchandise then they like it they go and watch the movie right that's the whole disney thing correct you see, but the problem with Genting is this, you know, <laughs> you go there you lose money then you it's very hard for you to come back unless yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean like you, yeah. if, if you have a customer, you don't want him to lose him lose too much money. Like. Yes, exactly. Right? And, and exactly. the entire casino industry is built on people losing money. Yeah. Right. The majority has to lose uh, has to lose money for the house, in this case, Gunting to win. So naturally, it, like again, okay, so you know we always talk about TAM. Yeah. We always talk about uh, all of that. Whilst there will always be gamblers, there will always be Chinese people who want to gamble. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's this weird industry where the TAM grows, but then the company itself will actually bring the TAM down <laughs> because people keep losing money. <laughs> right? For those of you all listening who don't know what TAM is, it just means the total adjustable market, right? The amount of potential yeah. that revenue have. So to, for them to make money, someone has to lose, you know? So it's a yeah. win-lose sort of. Yeah, It's not yeah. entirely yeah. win-lose because obviously, you know, people are enjoy being there. Uh, you got the staff and all that. But by and large, it's win lose. So, yeah, it's this weird industry. I think it's only unique to to, to the gambling industry, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, what's worse is this. Uh, um, I think over the long run, right, uh, while they may be monopolistic in Malaysia because of the licensing, they have this mode here. But when they compete against uh, guys like Sands, guys like all, all those Macau list, yeah. uh, companies, right? It all boils down for me uh, uh, is scale, scalability again. Uh, because yeah. you go to Cambodia, virtually, uh, the Genting is there, but they can't beat Naga, Naga World. Uh. <laughs> you get what I mean? So, so first mover advantage, uh, scale, um, and coupled with this very weird economics of reducing, uh, I wouldn't say, redu- you wouldn't say reducing time, but uh, reducing a recurring income because you wouldn't be, yeah. if you lose right unless they, you're talking about the junkets uh, the junkets where they bring in these high rollers and all that there's always a market for them but you talk about retail guys if you lose once twice hmm, not likely to return uh. yeah so that's why they yeah I mean there's really not much for me to say uh, Genting will be Genting as long as there's Chinese people yeah. in Malaysia Genting will always be there but yeah. you know the Chinese population in Malaysia is not even growing. It's, it's dwindling. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, flat lah. I know I would say flat, right? So yeah, yeah. and it has no branding overseas. It's yeah. very hard also for like even like when you think of branding, it, it's usually for gambling places, right? It's usually an area. So like when you Las think gambling, Las Vegas, you think Macau, Macau. right? Mm. But you don't like pinpoint a specific brand. Yeah. Right, so yeah. I think that's some of the troubles I have with this, and I think it shows in the results, right? Revenue growth. I think this is one of the worst kinds. Yes. Uh, okay, not not the worst, but it, this is a very uh, unfortunate situation because you are growing scale, right? To go from seventeen billion to twenty one billion is not a small feat, right? It yeah. is actually an achievement. However, there's no commensurate growth in profit, so yes. you are essentially selling more for the same results yeah and you know we have not i've not broke down you know like the segments but it could even be the case that the reason it is only two cases is the other guys the other segments that are actually dragging down the leisure and gaming or the leisure and gaming uh actually the margins are shrinking yeah and uh i think they tried i mean uh, kudos to tan sri lim he tried uh, his foray into cruises and you know it, but it's still I, I i'm not done the breakdown as well but i feel even the cruises uh the majority of their revenue will still come from gaming on the cruises rather than the cruises itself la. <laughs> maybe I, I i may be wrong but 
Yeah. They try to expand into so many things, plantation, property, power, oil and gas and all that. I, if they have great businessmen, subsidiary businessmen running the business, fantastic. But if not, then it loses focus as well. Uh, you know, who, who are they? Even, even if they go into... What, once ESG teams all start kicking in, right? I think yeah. uh, Genting also, it's, it's going to be a victim again <laughs> of ESG. Yeah. yeah. So and a lot of things not working for, towards, towards their, their benefit. Lah. Yeah, and they're not entering uh, sectors that are, you know, high growth. Yeah. Right? Like even like Azure, the pretty established company, you know, they still went to payment space. Whether it works out or not, separate question, right? Yeah. Then payment space, then do logistics. Uh, I, I, I just don't see that with Genting. Lah. And I think, I mean, this is just my speculation. This is a, I mean, the potential is that because, you know, where's the incentive for them to do better? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I, I, I'm 100% aligned with you. Lah. It's a family, it's still family run. Um, They've tried to institutionalize, but then. Yeah, I think even if they institutionalized, uh, the, the big issue is that Maybe they need a Jalil, you know. They yeah, need a Jalil probably to but spice how, things up. How how is Jalil as a Muslim going to run a gaming company? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> need a Chinese Chinese Jalil. Chinese, Chinese Jalil. Jalil. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next yeah. talk. As usual, if you enjoyed the video, remember to give it a like so that more people can see it. Uh, comment anything you want to comment. Uh, subscribe. Click on the notification bell so that you never miss any new videos. All right, John. This is uh, some very, very, how should I put it? Very, very uh, negative news, right? Yep. About our country. It is very, um, you know, the, the, the words used, failed statehood. Uh, the, my... the moment you hear that word, what do you think of, you know, the straight, straight away you think of countries like Zimbabwe, Tanzania, kind of. kind of. Yeah, that's true. But you know, that day, <clears throat> that day I ordered some very nice donuts and it still arrived. La. So <laughs> I, I, I think these are very uh, high octane, very, very explosive uh, titles on articles or statements, right? And... When people see this, immediately they assume something, right? And that means that the country is failing and all that. I, I would draw a distinction between state and country. If you specifically mean that the state is failing to carry, on, carry out the functions that a state should carry out, I think there's an argument there, right? Because mm, correct. obviously a state needs to have a functioning government. Uh, here we have... Um, political alliances being split, right? After certain announcements that they don't like. So in that sense, it is uh, failing. But yeah. on the flip side, you do have, uh, you know, things are still functioning, right? Mm. There's still electricity, there's still water, you know, you, you can watch YouTube, the internet's still running, you know, a lot of the things that we all uh, ch cherish or should cherish is still up and running and you, but anyway this Bloomberg colonist basically said that Malaysia is en route to being a failed statehood and the reasons he gave was uh, of course the politics right which we will not get into yeah. uh, as to whether <clears throat> which side we think is right that's not our business and the second reason is the SOP the lack of clarity now what this has resulted to is if you guys have been following the news or people have been forwarding you messages is I believe the Japanese, the German, and the American trade ambassadors are actually raising a point. And to me, this is the first time I'm seeing this. And obviously, this causes worry, right? Because Malaysia depends on FDIs, uh, you know, foreign direct investments. You know, Japan, Germany, and America, you can't really get any much bigger than this. I'm just surprised the Chinese haven't complained yet. <laughs> so, John, um, are we a failed statehood, you know? I don't think so. Uh, last I checked, I, I don't walk out on the street and I don't get a hit, uh, a, a, a gun to my head kind of thing, yeah. you know, <laughs> touch wood. But I, I think as you've pointed out earlier about uh, all these headlines that actually, in a way it triggers a lot of emotion because it triggers a lot of frustration that uh, the normal citizens in Malaysia are actually, uh, are actually feeling on the ground, especially. Especially, uh, you look at 
SME business owners. I mean, we're SME business owners or even micro business owners. Yeah. And we find it a hassle to actually uh, run our operation, our day-to-day operations of our business. But we somehow just have to find and uh, uh, think out of the box on how to carry on. But a lot of businesses are, are not as lucky as us. In a way, they're not uh, digital. Yeah. Uh, they cannot deliver their offering digitally. Uh, they have to have a premise or they, they need a physical presence to actually deliver their services or their goods and products. And I think when statements like this are highlighted in the press, it actually just just, it just hits a nerve. Lah. <laughs> you get yeah. what I mean? Um, where I would differ slightly from all these uh, headlines is actually looking at data sets. And uh, I don't blame a lot of investors because if they had focused a lot of their portfolio and attention on what we call thematic kind of investing in the past, I think 2018 rings a very uh, vivid bell for them, you know. So I'm just going to show the the, uh, the amount of companies' uh, market capitalization loss (laughs) because Mm. of the change in government. So I'm referring to companies like George Kent, who was the uh, contractor for the LRT and MRT projects. They had... 1.5 1.5 billion market cap wiped off uh, from May until December 2018. Uh, f- following that, I think uh, the worst hit was this company called Gamuda. So they had <laughs> many yeah. f- uh, cancellation of projects. They had 6.35 billion, you know, on my screen. Uh, wiped off. As, as you can see from the charts, it's just like just one line straight down, you know. And uh, IJM as well, um, they had 5 billion loss. That's okay, huge. five bi- yeah, that's huge. You're talking about five billion. That's, if I'm not mistaken, when before Serba Dynamic had their uh, their problems, right? I think their market cap for the entire Serba was about five billion to six billion. So can you imagine for IJM, uh, market cap loss uh, of five billion? Just that means one one entire Serba just wiped off lah, <laughs> just because of a change in government and the perception. That's right. Yeah, um, and the last I think uh, is actually Maiji, 2.7 billion uh, wiped off their market cap. Now, the reason why I want to bring this up and in, in contrast to, to the headlines is Malaysia, I feel uh, the economy still is quite robust. Yes, there are a lot of hindrances with the SOP and the EMCO today. I think uh, look back two years from now, I think that is all, it will look temporary because it's something that the entire world is facing through pandemic. But right. if you look at a, at a whole, right, uh, MJ, as I was uh, digging some data uh, last night, do you know Malaysia's GDP per capita is still on the rise, even though there was a stagnation in 2018, 2019, came down a little bit. But what I did was I compared against Brazil, you know, uh, MJ. Brazil yeah. has actually regressed <laughs> for a country. Yeah. Uh, they hit peak roughly about thirteen thousand uh, uh, US dollars per capita. Now they are they are below ten. Malaysia has not has not done that. So if you want to look at failed states, I think Brazil is a more uh, better. I, okay, I know Brazilians will be up in arms when I say this. <laughs> but, yeah, the, but, the the one Brazilian watching this video, yeah, he'll be pretty. Yeah, angry. yeah. So, but the the Brazil GDP per capita has actually regressed much more. They hit a peak thirteen, and then now it's back to to below ten. So. If it's a failed state, I think this will be, in a way, a, a clearer example. Uh, that, so that's how I put it. I think the charts you bring out is very interesting because uh, let me touch on some of the 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 share prices that you show, right? So yeah. for those of you all who are a little bit more, let's call it, uh, you know, if you pay a little bit more attention, you realize that only one company made some sort of recovery. And mm. that is the last one, which is Maiji. Correct. Right, and so this is a good point because I think that the the big question now for investors is: is it like should we sell your stocks? Basically, I'm literally mm. refi- receiving messages right, even from yeah. uh, you know family members and all that. Like, is it time to sell? And my question is: look, there's no wrong, like, there's nothing wrong selling it. Yeah. But have you done your homework to say okay, what stocks you're going to buy? Yes. When things like really crash because as of now it hasn't really crashed yeah but are you prepared right and this is something that we emphasize a lot in our stock investing blueprint program where you need to really really have a checklist of a checklist and watch list of companies to go into when things uh, don't do as well so my thoughts on this is with a very unstable government situation now 
you need to be investing in industries that are a lot more stable. Yeah. Right? So if you look at uh, what? Uh, Gamuda, uh, what's the other two again? Uh, I, IJM and George Ken. IJM and George Ken. These are reliant on stable governments. Yes. Because if the government is not stable, they don't get the projects. Yes. But in contrast with someone like <clears throat> Maiji and it's very apparent in the numbers, they, I wouldn't say they will never be affected, but they are much less affected compared to them because it doesn't matter what government comes in. Yeah. There's still only going to be one guy handling your online uh, road tax payments. Yes. Right? So I think that's the first uh, insight that I want to bring uh, to everyone. And yeah. again, you want to be looking for companies in this sort of situations or even better, not even linked to the government at all. That's so, right. Look at the semiconductor companies, look at some of the retail companies. Look at the glove companies. In a way, yeah, they and- are totally not reliant. In, in a way, they are reliant for taxation incentives and all that. Yeah, every, everyone but- is reliant to some extent, right? But yeah. you're right, right? Uh, they're not. At the end of the day, their fate is tied to the US. So I think one bit of uh, suggestion that I would give definitely is to look for companies that make money outside of Malaysia. Or when they are in Malaysia, their position, like for example, Nestle Malaysia. Yeah. Right, like, okay, if there's a recession, people are still going to drink my loan, etc., etc. Right? Yeah. So this is um, important also because a lot of people are having that wait and see attitude. And I think that in theory, it sounds good, but uh, you have to wait, see, and also hunt and aim. If that makes sense to you, John. Yeah, and uh, the problem is the moment they aim, right? And then the price goes up a little. They say, hey, don't worry. I'll wait till it goes down some more. And then yeah. the price go up. Ah, yo, too expensive. Cannot buy now. Wait until yeah. it comes down again. So in a way, you always they're always in this cycle. <laughs> yeah, They're always in this cycle because of not having enough confidence by because of not having done the work. Like, like you know, you pointed out my EG. Remember there was a question that says, Oh, my G is bad. You know, they're not going to get contracts anymore. But then when you In 2018, deeper, right? Yeah, yeah, 2018. And when you dig deeper, you find out only 20% of their revenue base was actually coming off uh, very government-reliant contracts and 80% was not. So you see, that they, 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 their aim goes to yeah. uh, reward those who, do, who did their homework uh, and due diligence. Uh. Yeah, I think the key thing here is you want to know who your customer is. If yes. the majority of your customer is the government, the government actually paying you money. Straight yeah. out of taxpayers' money. I mean, the government never makes any money, right? It just taxes people. Um, then that is dangerous. Yes. Of course, it depends on the government, right? Like if you're in a more, if you have a more stable government uh, elsewhere, you know, might be a good business. But my yeah, but EG, on your point, uh, sorry, uh, on your point, uh, is yeah. is a uh, is a good thing that you mentioned this because it triggered my memory about. Um, you know, uh, the Pentagon awarded a cloud servicing, con- uh, cloud-based uh, military contract to Microsoft. And it was ah. a very big contract. They won. They, uh, Amazon lost out. But now the US government, so-called stable government, right? Made a yeah. U-turn, you know, MJ? So they yeah. canceled that 10 billion contract. And now they says they're going to award it to, to, to Amazon and the likes of Microsoft. So they don't want to have a concentration. So I'm, I'm giving you a counter to say that even if you have one of the most sta- so-called stable yeah. governments in the world, <laughs> these things can happen as well. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Although, I mean, it would be interesting. I think some people will, not me, but some people might debate about whether the US is a very it's stable got, government. Yeah, correct, but, correct. But I'll go, go back to the US because I think this is a very good uh, point they bring up about the US. But before that, um, it's important to know who your customers are. You're because absolutely right. Yep. Even though my EG people say it's government link, government link, government link, yes, but it's very consumer facing. It's not yes. the government paying them the tax, the road tax. Correct. Yes. It is the people paying them. Yeah. So, if you have the people paying you money, that is a good sign, right? Whereas George Ken and all that, right? It's the government paying the money to build the yeah. stuff. Yes. That is a very different uh, relationship. So I think another point I want to make is about the GDP and all that. And uh, why actually Brazil lack us? It's very simple. It's oil and gas. Yeah. Right? We are not very dependent on oil and gas, contrary to what people think. And that's why yeah. it's important to look at some of our export sectors. Of course, E&E gloves, chemicals, plastics. Palm oil. Uh, palm oil. Mm. I, I would say focus on this, those uh, industries. 
Yeah. Now, going back to your point about the US, I think this is where it's very important and I hope to give some words of uh, comfort, actually. I actually posted on Instagram story uh, on the on the Firo Instagram. For those of you who haven't followed, please go firo.co, F-I-R-L dot C-O on Instagram. And, oh no, actually it's on my personal Instagram, sorry. But yes, please follow Firo anyway. So, <laughs> I say that the big difference between Malaysia and Singapore, right? Because every time there's something bad happening in Malaysia, it's always brought it up in comparison to Singapore. The big difference is this. In Singapore, people succeed because of the government. The government creates the environment and essentially pushes the people to succeed. Right? But in Malaysia, the people succeed in spite of the government. That's why I think the Kita Jaga Kita movement. Are you familiar with it, right, John? Yeah. Right? It's We Help We for those of you who are not uh Malay trade. Who don't yeah, who don't understand the language, yeah. It's it's exactly what it should be. The people's movement. It's uh it's, very similar to the Philippines. People. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look look at how the Philippines overthrew the government. And yeah. and it's great that you brought up this point because if you look at the you know we did the Fire Ten Bagger MJ, uh, I think yeah. about three weeks back. Yeah. If you look at the companies that were the multi baggers, right, they were not companies that relied on GLC contracts. Yeah. They were not companies that relied on, you know, government handouts and all that. Yeah, they benefited from the taxation benefit. But all these guys were, in a way, Malaysian champions that went abroad, that yeah. provided services uh, and, 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 and uh, goods outside of Malaysia. And yeah, they, they, they don't rely on a, a, a government giving them an LRT or MRT project. And th- those were the companies that were multi-baggers. <laughs> Absolutely right. And yeah. that's why, you know, Malaysia has survived uh, bad politics. Yeah. Right. And that actually shows the resilience. So, you know, I just now I talked to you about the US and how this is related. The answer is very simple. I believe since 20, I need to check my stats again. But over the past 20 years, the US government has actually shut down like 13 times, something like oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> Especially during times. Trump's time. <laughs> but you see, it didn't matter. Even during yeah. Obama, it happened as well. It, you see, yeah. it didn't matter. And I think that is the kind of country the Malaysia is in that if the government don't exist, we, we are, we are, they might fail, but that doesn't mean that Malaysians are going to fail. Yeah. Right? It's not like Singapore, right? Like I said, my IG story, if the government fails in Singapore, that's it. It's game over. Yeah. In Malaysia, uh, you know, not really the case. The only way we fail is if we fail as the... Uh, as as the a citizen. citizens, yes. Yeah. I so think any last words, move- John? Yeah, yes, no, sorry. grassroots movements was the best. Uh. Grassroots movements where... Uh, they know they have these Malaysians. I, I think one one thing that we really need to salute Malaysians is they know that regardless they have to survive on their own. Yeah. They know that uh uh you gotta figure out as especially as entrepreneurs, you gotta figure out things uh rather than waiting for someone else to pave the road for you. And I think yeah. Uh, that that's the point that both of us are trying to bring across. That that that's the resilience that Malaysian Malaysian companies have shown, and I think that if you tr- miss that completely from your investment analysis, I think that's where you won't enjoy the ride, lah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So to summarize, you know, Malaysia works in spite of the government. Yeah, and you know, as an investor, this is an investing channel. It's not about politics. Um, as an investor, look for the companies that are going to be resilient. Look out for the companies that are going to do well, even if uh, so-called the government or the state will fail. Yeah. 